All right, Vox. How you guys doing? How we doing? How we doing? Test, 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 test. Boom, 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 boom. Boom, test, one, two, three, test, one, two, three. I was about to start rapping. You're so lucky that they that they handed me a different mic. So anyway, uh, I told you all last week that I had one group project in my entire schooling history that was incredible. Um, and I, there's a caveat to that, though. There's a, there's, a, there's a thing I have to say about that, though. It was. I had one group project that ended up perfect. The end goal, here's what happened. Here's what happened. In college, I had a group project in which my group got the best score that that professor has ever given. Now, let, now let, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, listen, that's incredible. That's incredible. But what I didn't tell you is that there was one guy in the group that as soon as, because it was random, the, t the professor picked the group. And so she said, you're with these people on the first day of class. First day of class, you were put in a group. And I have no idea who any, any of these people are. But I'll tell you, there's one guy I judged so hard. I knew, like, as soon as I saw him, I was like, you do not do work. You do not, you do not do anything in this class. In fact, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty confident, um, I'm pretty sure he was high every single class. Um, and I'm pretty confident he would go to, like, uh, he would go in the middle of class and smoke again and come back, okay? Like, I'm pretty sure this was part of, and as soon as, I was like, no, man, I can't have this guy. And, and yet, there was one time that our group was meeting at the library, and so we all got to the library, and we're waiting, and he doesn't, he's not there. And we're like, oh, my gosh. This guy, he's going to be the one guy. And you start to have that conversation about the one person in your group who's not going to pull their weight. You know what I mean? Like the rest of the group, you're like, that guy, he's the worst. He's the worst. Like 10 minutes in, he comes in to the library, and he's like, his shirt is ripped. He's got a black eye. He's like, he's got stuff all over his body. And he comes in the room, and we're like, he's like, the best part was he comes in, guys, I'm, I'm so very sorry. I'm late. I apologize. Things kind of got out of hand. We're like, what do you mean things got, got out of hand? He's like, well, my brother in Miami, like three and a half hours away, my brother in Miami saw someone cheating uh, or saw his girlfriend cheating on him with a guy. And so he asked me to come and fight him. So I went to Miami this morning. I fought him. I just got back. Now, I don't endorse any of that, but can I just say the man's dedication to the group project was intact. He was like, hey, God, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to cut this fight short. I'm, <laughs> I can only be 10 minutes late to my group project meeting, all right? And, and there's something about this. Um, there's something about this that's hilarious to me, but the reality is when you're trying to do, when you're trying to do stuff, you're going to find resistance. And I remember, um, I remember trying to do something that was really good at my middle school. In my middle school, I tried to start a Christian club. And for the life of me, I cannot remember the name of this Christian club, but I'm sure it was a bad acronym. I'm positive. I'm positive it was a terrible, cheesy acronym that had something to do with Jesus. I have no idea what it was, but I know, um, but I tried to start this Christian club at my school, and I remember going like the first day, and I had a CD player with a mixtape of Reliant K and VeggieTales, <laughs> and, and, uh, and I put on, I put on this, this like CD, like to, to set the atmosphere, and like two girls showed up. Wait, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. But I was expecting the entire school. Like in my mind, the entire school should have showed up to this thing. I was like, I promoted this. I've got atmosphere. What more do they want? And I remember I would go, I would go into, I would go into the lunchroom. It was a club during lunch, which means everyone is, was at school already, which means no one had an excuse to not be there at my Christian school. 
And I'd go to lunch and I'd be like, hey, you should come to my club. And they're like, that's stupid. And I just remember this moment. I just remember this moment where I'm sitting, I'm not sitting, I'm standing at the end of a table. And it's an entire table full of kids. And I know none of them are churched. I know none of them actually love Jesus. They all just go to a Christian school. And I just remember sitting at the end of the table just trying to plead with them like, just come to my club. Please, you need this. And they're like, no. And I don't know if you've ever been in a place in your life where you were trying to do something, you were trying to do something good or nice or helpful, and you got pushback for it. Like, like you tried, you know, you got out of a car to move the turtle out of the road, and then somebody honked at you, and you're like, I saved the turtle! You know, like whatever it was, like you tried to do something nice, and you got pushed back, and and our church is looking at a guy named Nehemiah, and Nehemiah is incredible because, uh, because he tries to do something good, and he encounters a ton uh, of issue. He encounters a ton of pushback, and we've been there. You know this. You know the moment that you decide that you are going to finally do your chores is the moment that your parents have had enough and come into your room, and they're like, you haven't done this chore yet. And you're like, I was about to, right? And you get in trouble. Like, you're leaving, you're leaving your room to, like, take out the trash, and your parents see you leaving the room, and that's their reminder that you haven't taken out the trash. Now you're in trouble, right? And you're trying to do something good, and it kind of backfires on you. And Nehemiah has this moment. We talked about who he was last week. Nehemiah, he's a, he's a slave in a city a thousand miles away from his hometown. He feels led by God to do, uh, do an incredible work. He wants to protect the city of Jerusalem and start a building project to build their wall. He feels led by God. He knows it's the right thing to do. It's God's city. He knows that this is what he needs to do. So he sets out, and he's going to do a thing that's an incredible thing, a good thing, a powerful thing, an important thing. In Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 10, so what happens is Nehemiah, he, he leaves, he starts walking for like three weeks, finally gets to Jerusalem, and he has to go, and he has to go and tell all of the enemies who have been attacking Jerusalem, like, hey, by the way, I have permission to build the wall, you dirtbags, right? That's what he has, he has, per, he's, he's got to go and say, like, listen, we have the king's permission to do this. So you can't be mad about this. And so he goes. But Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 10. It says, but when Sanballat, everybody say Sanballat. Listen, that's a dope name. Mark it down. Keep it in your memory. Five years when you have kids, do that. All right. Sanballat, I believe in you. Sanballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite official, heard of my arrival they were very displeased that someone had come to help the people of Israel. So these guys immediately, they don't like Nehemiah. You ever, you ever had somebody in the very first meeting you had with them, they don't like you? Like there was this, this kid who? Who is it? Oh, dang. I thought, you, I, was, I thought it was gonna be like Dylan. I thought it was gonna be the guy next to you. I was hoping for so much shade. Yeah. There we go. There we go. Now, he's confessing someone he didn't like on first impression. This is so healthy. Anyway, we, we've all had that moment where it didn't matter what you did. The first impression that you made on somebody, they like, I don't like you. And this is what happens in Nehemiah. Nehemiah shows up. They don't like him. And so verse 19 says, Sanballat, Tobiah, and then there's a third guy named Geshem the Arab. There's three guys, and when you read the story of Nehemiah, these guys come up over and over again. Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem heard of our plan to rebuild the wall. They scoffed contemptuously. That's a really awesome supervillain move, if you need one. If you need one, if somebody comes to you with an idea, and they're like, hey, 
I think, I think maybe, we, like, we, could, we should hang out after school sometime. <laughs> That's a good contemptuous scoff, okay? It says, they scoff contemptuously. What are you doing? Are you rebelling against the king? And here's the thing. In this message, I want to show you tonight. I want to show you tonight how Nehemiah, trying to do the right thing, trying to do a good thing, encounters resistance, and it changes. The resistance comes in four different ways. There's four different types of resistance that Nehemiah faces, and there are four different types of resistance that you and I might face as you pursue the Lord, as you try to do things in this world. You're going to face resistance for good things. There's four kinds of resistance that Nehemiah faced. The first one, they scoff, and they say, are you rebelling against the king? Now, I don't know if you remember, but like three seconds ago, I said, he was sent by the king with a letter saying, I, the king, have given you permission to build this wall. And these guys come in and they say, you know what? I bet I know why you're actually building a wall around Jerusalem. I bet your intentions are evil. I bet you have bad motives. I bet the reason that you're actually doing this is because you are going to rebel. And here's the thing. The first thing. The first thing that they do when they see Nehemiah is they doubt him. They doubt his intentions. They doubt his motives. They doubt his reasons. Have you ever had a moment where somebody came back at you and said, man, I don't think, I think you're doing this for all the wrong reasons. I think you're doing it. I think you're doing it. And for whatever it is, they say, you know, I think you're doing it to be cool. I think you're doing it to get attention. I think you're doing it to get money. I think you're doing it, I don't think you're doing it for the, I think you're trying to, I, I think you're trying to get that cute girl to like you. I think that's why you're doing it. I don't think you actually want to serve in box. I think what you're doing, I've said that to some of you. Oh, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, no, no. Like, have you ever had that moment where somebody, maybe, maybe it's even, maybe it's even that parent moment where you're about to do the thing and you go, I was going to take out the trash. And they're like, no, you were not. You feel that defeat. You feel that like, when somebody doubts you, and you know what happens? You know what happens sometimes when somebody doubts your intentions and doubts your motives? We get afraid that we can't prove them wrong. Right? Like, I, you know, I don't know how to convince you that my motives are right. I don't know how to convince you that my intentions are pure. So you know what? I'm not even going to do this. I, I'm done. I tried. You doubted me. I'm done. I was going to help, but then you questioned me. You think I'm a bad person. I'm trying to do a nice thing, but you think I'm bad for it. What's that about? And they doubt Nehemiah's intentions. They doubt his character. But he goes back to building the wall. And then Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 1, says, Sanballat was very angry when he learned that we were rebuilding the wall. He flew into a rage and mocked the Jews, which I just love that phrase, flew into a rage. That's how you need to describe events at your school. Like, you get home from school, you're like, what ha your parents are like, what happened at school today? I saw two kids fly into a rage. Anyway, verse 3, Tobiah the Ammonite, who was standing beside Sanbillet, remarked, that stone wall would collapse if even a fox walked along the top of it. Now, here's the thing. That's not an insult that still holds weight, right? You know, like, nobody, 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 throws, nobody throws that out like... Man, I got a new car. I really like my car. They're like, man, I bet if a fox walked on your car, it would knock your car over, stupid car. Powerful fox. Right? Like, that's not. But essentially what he's saying is, what he's saying is like, you can't do it. And what they begin to do is they begin to discourage. They begin to come alongside. And as they're rebuilding the wall, you have a group of people, Sanballat, Tobiah, um, 
and Geshem who are all, well, they're gathering people. They're actually gathering people to discourage everyone who's rebuilding. And they're saying all kinds of insults. Man, they're never going to be able to finish that wall. It's stupid. What a stupid project. What, they're never going to be able to do it. You have people, you have people that will come along and discourage you. You're trying to do something right. You're trying to do something good. They're going to come along and they're going to say, that's a terrible idea. I remember when I told one of my favorite teachers in high school that I was going to go into ministry with my life. And she told me, that's a waste of your mind. And here I was thinking, I felt like the Lord called me to this. I feel like this is the best thing I could do with my life. And I, one, of the, one of the people I respected most in my world at that time said, that's the worst decision you could ever make. You're going to throw your life away. You're going to have people who try to discourage you, who don't believe in the, the thing that you see, who don't recognize what's coming ahead. And so they'll talk bad about you. They'll talk about the people that are with you. And you know what? Sometimes you feel guilty because your friends are now being dragged into this. The people who supported you are now taking the brunt of a weight that was yours. You felt like, oh, this is, they're following me, and now they're getting flack for this. And many people at that point would just say, you know what, I'm done. I tried to help. I was doing a nice thing. I reached out to build this wall to protect you. I'm done. But Nehemiah keeps building. In verse, verse 7, it says, When Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs, Ammonites, and Ashdodites, which is like three nations, right, heard that the work was going ahead and that the gaps in the wall of Jerusalem were being repaired, they were furious. They all made plans to come and fight against Jerusalem and throw us into confusion. Literally, they're about to throw hands over this. The idea is we are going to come, we couldn't, we, couldn't just, we couldn't just break you down by doubting you. We couldn't break you down by discouraging you, but we will destroy you. And so they're like, all right, you're going to keep going? You're going to build the wall? We will come in and we will wreck you. Now it's one thing, it's one thing, like um, y'all remember in elementary school, it was like sticks and stones may break my bones, but. Yeah, words, names, those things. Yeah, yeah, and you say that, you say, and we say that, and we're like, oh man, but words really do hurt, right? And so do sticks and stones, right? That's the that's the beginning of that song. You recognize that when somebody actually like hits you, right? That's that's a line crossed, right? Like, if somebody gets violent to you, it's a game changer. And here's what happens: Nehemiah is trying to do a good thing. And they say, we're going to kill you over this. We're going to destroy the work. You're going to be dead. You won't even get to see the project finished. We're going we're gonna to destroy you over this. Right? They begin to threaten him physically. And Nehemiah, despite being doubted, despite being discouraged, despite being threatened destruction, he keeps building a wall. And then that's crazy. Because in chapter 6, verse 17, it says, During those 52 days, many letters went back and forth between Tobiah and the nobles of Judah. Now, Nehemiah is in Judah. And so the people, the leaders in Judah, the leaders that work with, the leaders that work with Nehemiah. Catch this. These are the guys that he has to work with. These are his friends. These are the people that he's trusting. Many letters go back and forth between Tobiah and the nobles of Judah. Tobiah, the enemy, for many in Judah, had sworn allegiance to him. Because his father-in-law was Shechaniah, son of Era, and his son Jehoanan was married to the daughter of Meshulam, son of Berechiah. I'm going to quiz you on all those names at the end. Hold them tight. You thought the PSAT was hard? <laughs> Scoff contemptuously. No, it says, here's the thing. Tobiah, 
is family related to, to people on the inside, people in Nehemiah's circle. And so what happens? They kept telling me about Tobiah's good things, and then they told him everything I said. And Tobiah kept sending threatening letters to intimidate me. Watch this. They come in to divide everyone that Nehemiah is close to. Like, watch this. Tobiah begins to write letters to people, and those people begin to tell everyone, hey, listen, Tobiah isn't a bad guy. I know Nehemiah hates him. I know Nehemiah is against him. Tobiah's not the bad guy. Tobiah's a really great friend of ours. Tobiah's awesome. You should, I mean, I don't know why everybody's mad at Tobiah. I, we like Tobiah. Tobiah's great. And Nehemiah constantly hears the good things, everybody's praise of Tobiah. Tobiah's awesome. Tobiah's awesome. And in the background, Tobiah is sending threats to Nehemiah. And everybody's going, Tobiah would never do that. Tobiah's a nice guy. He's a great friend of ours. He would never threaten. He, like, it's not that. Listen, Tobiah is awesome. And in the background, everything that Nehemiah says is getting sent back to Tobiah. Every word. Can you imagine? Can you imagine in your friend group? You have, you have, a, you have a, 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 a tiff. What do, what do we call him now? What do we call him? What do, what, if you got, you got beef? What is this? Beef? All right. If you've, got a, if you've got a full cow and you're trying to pull out some, you know, just, all right. Right, you got, some beef, you got some beef with somebody. Now imagine this. All of your best friends, all of your best friends are actually really tied to the person that you have beef with. And so every time, every time that you hang out with them, they're like, man, I know you don't like them, but they're really awesome. They're really great. And I think, right? Now, now I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be honest. That's the one. That's the one that hurts me the most because I've lived that. Because I've watched, I've watched, I've watched a podcast of three of my friends. Two of them, two of them had left, left this church and, and I followed up with them and said, hey, is there anything wrong? Like, do you have anything, do you have anything that we've done wrong? Anything against us? And two of these guys responded back and said, oh my gosh, no. I have nothing against you. You've been awesome. We love you. You're incredible. I can't. We would never say anything about you. And then I watched a podcast with three friends, with two of them that I've asked, and one who didn't know the situation. And they begin to share things with him about me, about disagreements that they had with me that they told me they didn't, about issues they have with me that they said were not issues. I don't know if you've ever been in that place. I mean, that's like kind of an extreme place. I've watched a podcast of my friends talk about me. And I watched another friend who didn't know the situation just agree with them. Oh, my gosh, I can't believe that happened to you. Oh, my gosh, that's, they did that to you guys? Oh, my gosh, I can't. They came in. To discourage Nehemiah, to doubt him, to destroy him, and to divide him. And can I tell you, if we're honest, because we're human, can I just be honest? When those things happen, most of us just quit. We just go, hey, listen, I did. I did everything. Nehemiah's, it's not like Nehemiah's doing something selfish. You know, it's not like at the end of this, Nehemiah is looking for a PlayStation. It's not like at the end of this, Nehemiah is like, I want a car. It's not like at the end of this, Nehemiah is hoping for some kind of connection. In fact, when Nehemiah finishes, he has to go back as a slave to Susa. 
He's literally just there to build a wall for people who don't care. But he knows that God has called him to do the good thing. And this, this, this is the crazy part. Because in Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 9, Nehemiah says they were just trying to intimidate us, imagining that they could discourage us and stop the work. So I continued with even greater determination. Do you know what happens to Nehemiah when, when all of the things come against him? He digs in. He solidifies his ground. He's like, I'm not going to move. This is where I stand. I know you're coming against me, but I know what I'm doing is right, and I know you're trying to scare me, but I will not be scared. I will be determined. I will see this to the end. I will see God's will out on this earth. Can I tell you, how many of you got to go to Vox Conference this year? Anybody got to go to, man, Vox Conference was incredible. Um, how many of you, how many of you went to Vox Conference and you, you, you believe that God did something good at Vox Conference? Can I see, come on, I'm encouraged by that. Can I tell you why? Because Vox Conference was awesome, unbelievably awesome, but you have no idea the resistance that came. And I wanted to share just a minute with you tonight. We had an awesome Vox Conference. We had more students from this church than have ever been before on anything. We had incredible moments of salvation and transformation. We had incredible, incredible moments. And you may not have known this. But we felt in the weeks leading up to Vox Conference, we could feel the tension spiritually like the enemy was coming against us. And the week of the Vox Conference, the week of, we get a call from Leland. How many of you like seeing Leland? We get a call from Leland, and Leland says, hey, guys, I'm so sorry, but my booking agency has double booked us. Did y'all know that? Did y'all know that when you looked on the stage and you saw Leland and our worship leader, Bree, and Southeastern University's worship team, it's not because we were like, let's get everybody together for a band. It's because their agency had double booked them even though we had booked them two years before, right? And so that week, we're in a panic. Leland calls. He's like, hey, by the way, um, there's only two of us coming. My bad. That week, we found out that Reggie Dabbs, how many of you loved Reggie? We found out that Reggie, all of his flights were canceled, and he wasn't going to be able to come. That week, we, we, we found out that um, all of the hotels and uh, food options for SEU were wrong. The day before the Vox conference, my, my wife and I were, were, were major parts in planning that. And um, day before the, the, the Vox conference, my kid, um, my kid gets sent out of school because they say he has hand, foot, and mouth. Right? Now, here's the thing. They, they sent him out of school, and, and we're... We're going, okay, but we have a lot to do for this. Like, this is like the day before Vox Conference. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. We can't, like, we can't be going home right now to watch, to, like, watch this. We need you. And so we took him to a doctor that night, and the doctor said, he's fine to go back to school. We were like, incredible. The next day, they say, the school says, he can't stay. Sorry, I know that doctor's note said it, but he can't. Day of, day of, my kids couldn't go to school. Our volunteer team leader wasn't able to come to the Vox Conference. The person in charge of all the volunteers for the Vox Conference couldn't come back. Our entire security team got COVID, couldn't come. I know I'm missing details. We bought, we bought brand new mics. Because I don't know if y'all remember, we had some like audio issues. You remember that? With Leland, we had audio issues. Um, we bought brand new mics. They came broken. 
right? And can I tell you, can I tell you, those three days, we were so excited and so burdened at the same point. Like there was so much we had, we had all kinds of, we had all kinds of stuff going on in the background. And we were so zealous. We knew God was doing an incredible thing, but there was so much resistance. There was so much working against us. And can I tell you, it's worth it. When God puts something on your heart that he desires for you to do, it's worth it. Be determined. Listen, the enemy has all kinds of tricks and, and tactics that he will use. But you know what? The Bible says that if you resist the enemy, eventually he gives up and flees. So if you just dig in and be determined, guess what? You win. God wins. If you just hold out, I know, I know that the doubt is going to hurt and the discouragement is going to hurt. And I know that the threats of destruction are going to be painful. And I know that when people divide against you, it hurts. But if you would just be determined and resist the devil and he'll flee. And after the battle, you'll be standing firm, I promise. We sang that God's a man of his word. and He's not going to stop being that for you. Listen, I know this. I know God's goodness. I know that when he calls you to something, he's faithful to finish every work. Listen, Nehemiah, Nehemiah doesn't go down in history. There's no, uh, he, nobody, nobody's famous for half doing something. Nehemiah is remembered as a hero. Because when everything came against him, he was determined. And my hope, my hope, is that you would grab a hold of that kind of determination. Last week I read a quote, and it's a guy who said, never tell, never tell young people that they can't do something. Because God may have been waiting for somebody um, as ignorant as them to, to, to believe that it could be done, Right? And I just love that. I love this idea that if we have faith in God and God says something and we're like, I know it's crazy. I know, I, I know everybody says it couldn't happen, but I, I trust God. And God said, I could do this. And so I'm going to do it. And everybody says, ah, that's ignorant. You don't know. You don't know no better. You don't know anything. You just say, but I'm determined. This is what God said. And I just want to encourage you, Vox, be determined. When trials come, be determined. Hold on. I want to pray for you. Father God, I pray that resolve would grow in our hearts. That we would have grit. God, I pray. You know, there's a, there's a verse that says, you strengthen our hands for war. And God, we're not talking about beating people up. We're, we're, we're asking that you give us the determination to do what's right in the face of opposition. God, that you give us the determination to do what's good because you've called us to. God, I pray that you give us the hope. Father, I did talk a lot tonight about the difficulty, but, but Lord God, I pray that we're reminded of how beautiful the hope in Jesus is. How like beautiful it is to hope in you and know that our, 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 our faith will not be in vain. God, that our hope has great reward. Father God, I pray that you would help us to hope dearly. That we wouldn't be discouraged. Even when, even when we're talking about bad things coming, we wouldn't be discouraged. We wouldn't be dissuaded. God, help us be determined. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you invite Sobe up to the stage? Make some noise. Oh, and Rihanna, I didn't see you. I was looking. Wow. I thought you were, there we go.